Thank you, Bethany, and uh, thank you, Professor Schreiber, for these words of wisdom uh, and great advice for all of us. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank all the nominees and uh, sponsors and all, make extensive my congratulations to all my classmates of 2020. This is a great honor to be uh, part of this excellent group, and I hope we can meet in person at some point in the future. Uh, today, I would like to briefly explain to you a little bit about what are our efforts uh, in research are about. But to understand a little bit our motivations, maybe it's better to start a little bit by explaining you what has been my academic journey so far, which started in Barcelona, where I graduated and I did my, my master's in organic synthesis. And then I moved to London, to the UK, to pursue PhD studies in the group of Professor Igor La Rosa at Queen Mary University. And upon graduation, I moved back to Spain as a Marie Curie Fellow to study uh, in the group of Professor Ruben Martin. And after that, I thought that that was not enough in my training, so I flew all the way to America, to the West Coast, to uh, carry out further postdoctoral studies at the group of Professor Phil Barnes, Scripps in La Jolla in California. And since 2017, uh, I've been a group leader at the Max Planck Research, uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Colin Forschung uh, in Mulheim in Germany. So a total of four different countries, four different languages that blended together. And I think this curiosity to explore different research environments has definitely impacted what has been uh, one of the main pillars of our research. So. Our aim, our main aim in the lab is to develop practical and efficient technologies for organic synthesis. And to do so, uh, we approach this, this problem with a threefold approach that we call. So we prepare new reagents, we develop new reagents, or we prepare new ligands that are uh, usually for transition metals to develop better catalysts, or we try to redesign completely catalytic systems and come up with new rules for catalysis, which would be the third pillar that I will briefly comment about. So today I would like to share with you three very, very short stories, uh, each one falling into one of these categories. So for example, from the point of view of reagent design, if one looks at these molecules, uh, they are synthetic drugs or natural substances such as DNA building material, adenosine, or drugs that can cure or, or have been used to, uh, to treat uh, several diseases. They contain a large number of different functionalities. And as a synthetic chemist, I wonder whether one could take these molecules and selectively functionalize them at a given position without affecting or destroying any other functionality. Now, this is really challenging. But to do so, we developed a reagent that is this pyrillium uh, tetrafluoroborate that is capable to target amino acid uh, amino groups very selectively and primes them for reactivity. And in this way, one can basically create higher orders of complexity from molecules that are already complex in a high degree of selectivity. Now, this reagent you can, without using uh, other uh, like. Uh, harsh conditions or uh, reagents that are currently used that would destroy completely these functionalities. Now, you could prepare this reagent. It's very easy to prepare, or you could buy it from commercial suppliers that has been recently available uh, on, in Sigma Aldrich Millipore Sigma uh, website. Now, this is the first mini story I wanted to share with you. So the second one is about the ligand design and how we think about it um, in particular for uh, nickel, one of the first raw transition metals. Now, to understand this mini story, this starts by looking at this complex here. This is nickel cyclooctadiene, arguably the most abundant and utilized nickel zero source, uh, uh, right? So currently, reactions catalyzed by nickel have become extremely important because they have unlocked a great potential by this con uh, by allowing new disconnections in, for organic synthesis that were previously unseen, right? But, but to do those nickel-catalyzed reactions, the only source of nickel zero that was uh, available is, was this nickel COD. And this guy is air sensitive and it gets really rapidly oxidized if you expose it to air, right? Therefore, it requires a storage under argon and probably inside of these glove boxes, you have to store it into the 
uh, into the cold, right, into the freezer of the glove box, because otherwise it's temperature unstable and it will decompose. And once you want to manipulate it in your fume hood, you have to use sometimes tedious techniques, uh, Schlein techniques. So all these drawbacks basically hamper the adoption of all those beautifully developed catalyzed technologies, catalyzed by nickel, to be used in a practical setup by many, many industries. So the question we asked was, would it be possible to develop a virtually exactly the same catalyst that does exactly the same than nickel caught, but doesn't need all these setups? That would basically break this uh, energy, activation energy to, for adoption for, for industries, maybe. So what we did is we looked at, at the ligand, uh, in particular these steel bin derivative ligands, and when you put CF3s, uh, trifluoromethyl groups into these ligands, one can achieve the synthesis of this complex here that has three olefins instead of four around the nickel. Now these complexes are now air stable, and this is a picture of it, we open to air, a more than 20 gram scale in a very practical setup for the synthesis. It has a beautiful picture of that shows in the X-ray stru uh, structure how three of these steel bins wrap around the nickel and protect it in the solid state from oxidation. And it's a 16 electron complex that is air stable. This is particularly remarkable. So what this new set of ligands allow you is to actually create a platform to study the electronics and make and create a whole family of these new nickel zero complexes, right? And I study their properties. And once we did that, we realized that in particular this one, when we replace these trifluoromethyl groups by terbutyl groups, this is extremely robust, very air stable, in solution stable. I don't want to uh, like uh, say much more about it, but it's basically a second generation, much more robust catalyst uh, for synthesis. So now what you can do with this is basically look at all those reactions that have been developed over the years based on nickel COD that has to be prepared inside the glove box and replace the nickel COD by this new catalyst, right? And where one catalyst does not reach reactivity, then you can replace it by another one of these air stable that has different electronics. Now you can basically cover all the palette of opportunities that nickel got offered. And these reactions can be set up very practically in the bench top without the use of a glove box and in your uh, and open to air. So from the point of view of practicality, this is, this is really, uh, I guess, uh, an advancement, I would say. And it's important to say that uh, uh, Professor Engel at the Scripps has also come up with a, with a catalyst that is air stable, a nickel zero catalyst that is, that is air stable that also can be used in certain, in certain contexts as well. Now, the last mini story that I also wanted to share with you today relates, takes a little bit of a step back from practicality and looks at the problematic in organic synthesis through the lenses of fundamental reactivity. And I'll tell you what I mean about it in a, in a second. So what we did here was to wonder, if one looks at the periodic table, and in particular, the central part of the periodic table is occupied by transition metals. And as I think Professor Schreiber already said that the orbitals changed everything. And it's true. So why transition metals have been so, so good at doing catalysis over the years? And it's one of the answers that we came up with is their ability to basically revolve between different oxidation states when they are doing catalysis. So we asked a very simple and fundamental question, which is, could we take those properties that have been doing transition metals extremely powerful and bring them over to an element that is not in the D block, but is into the P block? And we looked in particular to this element here, bismuth, because it attracted my attention, uh, certain features attract my attention, uh, certainly. It has a higher natural abundance, looks like, than the third raw transition metals, like noble metal, like iridium, platinum, gold, which makes it very cheap. Uh, I know sometimes this is not related, but for the moment, it's, it's very cheap to, to purchase. And it has another property associated to it, that despite the fact that it's surrounded by the most toxic elements on the planet, it has certain low toxicity associated to it, uh, as exemplified by these drugs that probably uh, you guys are familiar with, uh, the Pepto-Bismol that is an out-of-the-counter drug that you can get in the supermarket, or this anti-eye swelling uh, drug, which I don't know if it's uh, still uh, 
available or not. Or some of you have been in contact with some of this bismuth uh, this morning when you woke up uh, because it's part bismuth oxychlorides and nitrates are part of the makeup. But what we wanted to do is redox catalysis with this to try to unlock the redox properties of bismuth, of a main group element. So our approach was divided into two different manifolds, the low valent catalysis uh, uh, with bismuth and the high valent catalysis. So the, lay, the low valent would take a low valent uh, bismuth one and would revolve all the way up to bismuth three and back to bismuth one uh, in this way. Whereas the high valent catalysis would start from a bismuth three complex, go all the way to bismuth five and back to bismuth three in the catalytic cycle. And I can advance you that we kind of succeeded a little bit in this in this front, in both fronts, and I just don't have time to mention uh, to cover all the projects that we uh, that we developed here, but just briefly mention what are these redox processes that we developed. So the first one is this one three transfer hydrogenation, capitalizing in one of these bismuth one uh, NCN pincer complexes developed by Dostal, and we managed to uh, transfer hydrogenate a variety of unsaturated. Uh, compounds. And on the high valent manifold, we've been able to disclose a very important reaction for the pharmaceutical industry, which is the, com the conversion of boronic acids into aryl fluorides uh, via bismuth 3, bismuth 5 redox cycle. And lately, uh, we have disclosed a reaction that is beyond the scope of any transition metal and only capable so far with bismuth, that is basically the conversion of a boronic acid of an aryl boronic acid into an aryl triflate by using sodium triflate as your coupling partner. So this is, uh, to our, to the best of our knowledge, uh, quite interesting, uh, fundamentally, probably synthetically not very useful, but fundamentally very, very interesting. So with that, I just want to finish by saying that this threefold approach, uh, each uh, each pillar in, of our research basically enables three different things in our laboratory, either the rapid assembly of chemical complexity or trying to confer new physical properties to catalysts that are extremely powerful to break those applications for, for industry. And last but not least, this bismuth redox catalysis that basically unlocked a new paradigm for redox catalysis. So I just want to thank everyone that contributed since we started uh, in 2017, past and present members contributing with passion and ideas, and the funding institutions that allow this research to be done. And last but not least, uh, Professor Fusner for his support, his constant support uh, over the years, everyone at the MPI and at our neighboring institute for collaborations and help. And last but not least, thank you all for your attention and congratulations to everyone uh, for this talented 12 nomination. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Hi, Pat. Thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I'll ask the first question. So is your new nickel reagent commercially available now? Um, it is It is not. We have, we, we did patent it and we just uh, signed an agreement with, uh, uh, I think, Two weeks ago, we signed the agreement with one company. We are in the process of signing it with another one, so it should be commercially available uh, okay. quite soon. Um, someone in the chat asks, "How do you have any ideas about replacing the uh, pyrophoric triethyl aluminum that you use with that reagent? Yeah, um, so we, we, di we do have uh, alternatives. However, this is the, so we have Tones of triethyl aluminum in the in the column portion from the old times when Gunther Wilke and Klaus Porschke were doing nickel catalysis here. Actually, nickel COD was invented here at the column portion uh, in 1960. So we have tons and tons of a stock of triethyl aluminum, and this recipe of alkyl aluminums plus nickel two is is excellent for getting uh, low valent nickel complexes. And we just went with that one because is reliable, it is scalable, and it does not generate, all the byproducts can be washed away very easily. All the other alternatives we've tried, they do give you the product, but then you have to spend more time and more solvents to actually get rid of all the waste and, and get your compound pure. And last question, do you have any advice for other, for like an international student who's doing their PhD abroad? Um, uh, so an international student that is doing the PhD abroad, in what sense? Uh, so well, to, to in the back. sense that you were someone, yeah, you were someone who, were do, who was doing your PhD in a foreign country. Right. So what advice would you yeah. give to someone in that situation? 
So I basically never, uh, so, so I was very open to move to anywhere that like I wanted to go to. Um, so I was never restricted by any, uh, I didn't have any strings attached anywhere. So I was very free and I, and that allowed me to actually visit four countries, four different research environments. And that shaped a little bit, that, that basically shapes you as a researcher and gives you a lot of uh, different visions. And I think it's very useful to, to move around and then finally end up somewhere. Um, I would say that just travel, go go around, visit other environments, uh, and yeah, and learn as much as you can from other places. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, Pat.